Okay, we can we can move forward to our next speaker, um, Vinod Vaikuntanathan. Uh, Vinod is a professor of computer science at MIT and the chief uh, cryptographer at Duality Technologies. Uh, Vinod is the co-inventor of most modern fully homomorphic encryption systems and many other lapis-based post-quantum secure cryptographic primitives. And Vinod will talk about secure computation and PPML progress and challenges. We are very Thank happy you. to have you here. Thank you, Gilad, and uh, thanks to Antigone and you and uh, Rafi for, for inviting me. Uh, let me first try to share my uh, screen. Uh, yeah. Um, is that, uh, let's see. Hmm. Share screen. Everybody can see it? Okay, good. And everybody can hear me, I suppose. Yeah, that's good, okay. All right, so um, so so thanks guys for, for inviting me. Um, uh, the title is, uh, is is a little bit zero knowledge because I didn't know for a long time what I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, uh, and but, but, but here here it is. Uh, one second. I guess I'm still not that used to uh, um, Zoom. All right. Okay. Good. So um, so I wanna. So this talk is in two parts. Uh, the first one will fall squarely in the realm of secure computation. And, uh, and what, uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, a new technique in the realm of homomorphic encryption uh, and its application to constructing what we call asymptotically quasi-optimal batch OLE, uh, which is oblivious linear evaluation, and OT, which is oblivious transfer. And this is in joint work with uh, Leo de Castro, Yuval Ishai, uh, Karmit Hazai, and Mathu Venkata Subramanian. Uh, uh, and this sort of picture, this sort of the picture you should think of is so there are these two beautiful worlds. You know, there's a secure computation world which we inhabit as cryptographers, and there is this promised land of uh, privacy-preserving machine learning, and there is a sort of a bridge between the two worlds. So using one, you can get to the other. The second part of the talk, uh, I'll switch gears and I'll actually uh, talk about gaps between uh, the two fields, gaps between sort of secure computation and privacy preserving machine learning. This is something that I've been thinking about for a, for a while and I'll, I won't have much in terms of technical sort of details here to give you, but all I'll have is open problems. In fact, a lot of open problems and this will, uh, what I talk about here will be based on observations with uh, Itai Berman and Akshay Degwicker, with students of mine and Shafi Golbasa. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, we start with secure computation. You've heard a great deal about it already uh, today, but just to set the stage, we'll be talking about secure two-party computation, uh, where you have two parties, Alice and uh, Bob, um, who have their own private data sets, D1 and D2. They want to compute some function on the two data sets, F of D1, D2, and they want to do it without either party revealing anything about their data to the other. Okay, so this is, this is what we are all sort of familiar with in cryptography. Um, and of course, there are other architectures. There are multi-party architectures, peer-to-peer, client-to-server, client, client or what, what's called federated uh, these days, which you already which you just heard about um, in the previous talk. Um, one of the most sort of innovative contributions of the field of cryptography uh, in the 1980s was one, the definition of this problem, and two, a definition of what it means for such a protocol to be secure. And that was defined using, that, that, that's the ideal real paradigm, uh, what's called ideal real paradigm these days. Um, and what that says is, uh, is the following. So think of a, 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 an adversary that corrupts one, or in the multi-party setting, a subset of parties. And this adversary could be either semi-honest or malicious or somewhere in between. Um, and, and, and so ideal real paradigm tells you what it means for such a, a protocol to be secure against, uh, against an adversary of this form. And what, uh, what we say is, you know, whatever the adversary sees in, this, in the execution of this protocol, whatever the adversary can do in the execution of this protocol, it should also be doable and seeable by an ideal adversary called a simulator, which does not talk to the parties at all, but rather interacts uh, with an ideal sort of oracle, with an oracle that actually computes the functions for them. So the ideal adversary can only pick the inputs, um, send it to the oracle, 
and you can see the outputs, but that's it. Okay, so that seems pretty benign. And you say, well, you know, if the real protocol is as good as this ideal world, then, you know, that's good, right? So this is a mathematically precise definition. It has really sort of shown the light for much of the, or for really all the work in this field uh, over the past, uh, I don't know, 30, 35, 40 years, right? Um, yeah, you could sort of define it sort of for both parties and for collusions of parties. And we now have a ton of techniques uh, to construct secure computation protocols. You, you heard a great deal about it in Yuval's talk. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, in my mind, you know, I need an organization system to, to just keep track of sort of the kitchen sink of protocols. So I divide it into sort of the 20th century uh, protocols, uh, which are sort of the garbled circuit protocol and the Goldreich, Mikali, Wigderson protocol, and, and a lot of derivatives of these protocols, um, you know, um, uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we have come up with uh, since then. Um, and, uh, um, um, and, uh, and, and Cryptopia, 21st century crypto, uh, which uses sort of fancy tools like fully homomorphic encryption or threshold fully homomorphic encryption, um, and even more recently, homomorphic secret sharing and related and friends um, to construct secure computation protocol. So this is really a, a sort of a modern development in the last sort of uh, 10, 12 uh, years. Um, and again, in my mind, I need an organization system. So I kind of try to sort of find out what are the trade-offs, what are the relations and trade-offs between these different techniques. And I have a very sort of like mm, uh, rough sort of line between them. And uh, you heard some of it from uh, Yuval already. Um, the 20th century crypto techniques um, are, are great at computation. So other than a few, in, in fact, input size many uh, oblivious transfers, at least in the case of garbage circuits, um, or pre-processing in the case of the GMW protocol, you can do the rest of it either information theoretically or just using uh, AES, sort of one-way functions, mini crypt. Right? Um, that's exactly where the modern techniques sort of uh, fall short. Uh, their computational complexity is super, super high. Fully homomorphic encryption is famous and notorious for being computationally very complex. On the other hand, fully homomorphic encryption and FSS and homomorphic secret sharing um, give you great sort of communication complexity, essentially proportional to the input length. Um, and not always, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, but, but sometimes. Uh, but their communication, but, uh, um, uh, but the communication complexity of the 20th, 20th century crypto protocols is typically proportional to the circuit size, uh, which is a lot larger. All right, so, so communication versus computation is what separates 20th century from, uh, is one of the things that separates 20th century from 21st century. So one thing that um, uh, is sort of worth remembering is that this line is not a dogma by any means, right? So, you know, you have a set of tools and you can combine them in any possible way. You can, you don't have to sort of, when you're designing a secure computation protocol, you don't need to stick to garbled circuits. So you don't need to stick to threshold FHE. You can really combine the slew of techniques you have. That's something that people have done. Uh, and I, I'm really here going to focus on homomorphic encryption. People have sort of come up with various ways to use lattice-based homomorphic encryption, not necessarily fully homomorphic, just homomorphic encryption in a sparingly sparingly and in a judicious way. So that's something that people have done quite a bit over the last decade. Uh, perhaps the, so the first such result is, um, is the speeds protocol um, of, of Damgat et al. Um, and they used sort of homomorphic encryption to generate sort of multiplication triples, uh, which is sort of something that you can use down the line uh, in secure computation protocols. Um, private information retrieval is yet another place where people have used sort of like um, limited versions of homomorphic encryption to, which, or to already sort of construct uh, pretty good protocols. Um, more to the point of this workshop, um, um, you know, uh, we sort of uh, constructed this uh, system called Gazelle, uh, which can actually do uh, secure two-party uh, inference for convolutional neural networks a few years ago. Um, and it is along these lines that I, the first part of my talk will go. We will actually, I will show you a construction of batch OLE and batch OT but using the machinery of lattice-based homomorphic encryption, but in a sort of a careful and judicious way. And along the lines, we'll actually need to develop new techniques for lattice-based homomorphic encryption. Okay, so that's the sort of point of the first part of the talk. Um, uh, and before I sort of really get to it, 
Um, I have to sort of set the stage and, uh, and let me do it by telling you what the homomorphic encryption instruction set is. Right? So this is, you don't have to know necessarily the mathematics or the lattices or even bring out the BUE sort of underlying uh, homomorphic encryption schemes. Um, all you need to know is that homomorphic encryption deals with at least sort of modern homomorphic encryption schemes from Ringel WE, uh, Ring Learning with Errors, uh, deals with data that are vectors. Uh, so the data is an element of ZP to the N, where P is a plain text domain, and uh, ZP to the N is sort of a vector, it represents a vector, a vector of uh, plain text from ZP. Right, so you should really think about N as being large, largish, 10 to the three, 1,000, 10,000, can maybe even go further, and P should be pretty small. Uh, it's two to the eight, so eight bits or 16 bits or 32 bits, right? Not 2048 bits or 4096 bits that you're used to in Payer or other additively homomorphic encryption schemes. Okay, so th those are the data types. Those are the data that I'm going to manipulate, ma encrypt and manipulate with homomorphic encryption. I'm going to denote sort of encrypted uh, vector A by, you know, these square brackets, okay? So what is the instruction set? Uh, homomorphic encryption gives you a way to add uh, numbers. So SIMD is, uh, um, single instruction multiple data, just in parallel, right? So you can take two vectors A and B encrypted, and you can construct a vector A plus B. You can also construct, uh, you can also take a plain text A and encrypted B and construct A times B, but A times B here denotes coordinate wise product of two vectors. Another thing that turns out to be super useful in using uh, homomorphic encryption is slot permutations. When you're dealing with vectors, you might wanna move these elements of these vectors uh, you know, uh, to different slots. And that's something you can do as well. Um, so you can take A, an encryption of a vector A, you can take a permutation and you can construct an encryption of the permuted vector A. Okay. And finally, uh, the final thing is uh, SIMD multiplication, which is which just sort of takes two ciphertexts and computes the sort of coordinate wise product of the ciphertext. Okay, so these are the instructions we have at hand. And by now we actually know pretty well, you know, how the complexity of these instructions relate to each other. So this is a table that I'm sort of, you know, lifting uh, sort of directly from the Gazelle paper that we wrote a few years ago. And there we actually came up with micro benchmarks for these, for these instructions. In fact, there it turned out that we didn't have to use SIMD multiplication. So all you see here are numbers for addition, scalar multiplication and permutations. Um, so, you know, just sort of eyeballing the numbers, you see that SIMD addition is super cheap, uh, right? Per slot, you spend eight cycles, right? Eight clock cycles. Um, multiplication, scalar multiplication is slightly more expensive, but still very well within the realm of feasibility, 15 clock cycles. And then when you go to sort of, you know, the other two operations, you start seeing the, so the overhead that FHE or homomorphic encryption is so infamous for. Um, so permutations, it turns out, are very useful when you do things like matrix vector multiplications. Uh, and for that you pay, well, depending on sort of which setting you're in, you see wildly different numbers on the right-hand side. And that tells you sort of, you know, you know, that differs based on what class of permutations you want to support, really all permutations or just rotations and so on and so forth. Um, and that could cost you up to two orders of magnitude, two to three orders of magnitude really um, uh, in, in the runtime. Multiplication is not something that I have numbers for, but that again is of the same sort of uh, order of magnitude slowdown, just two to three orders of magnitude, right? Um, so that's what we have at our disposal. Um, and uh, I'm going to call uh, an encryption scheme which just supports additions and scalar multiplications, SIMD, uh, as a packed additively homomorphic encryption. If you wanna do that plus permutations, I'm going to call it uh, packed additively homomorphic encryption with permutations. Okay, so these are really the sort of the components that I'll use. In fact, in this talk, I will only need additions and scalar multiplications, and that's good enough for me. Right? And those are the good operations. Those are the ones that actually run fast. So uh, these works that I uh, that I referenced a couple of slides ago, they actually use sort of limited sort of homomorphic encryption schemes to do very interesting things. Uh, Speeds, for example, uses homomorphic encryptions that supports one multiplication, just a single multiplication. Uh, the private information retrieval protocols, um, the seal pair uses, uh, um, you know, additive, packed additively homomorphic encryption plus rotations uh, to essentially implement the old sort of 20, you know, 20, uh, 20 years old uh, Kushlevitz ostrovsky protocol for peer. Uh, and there are more recent works that actually take these sort of different approaches to peer and actually try to compare their performances in different ranges of parameters. Uh, so Malpeer is a, it's a work that appeared uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Usenic security, and that's yet another example. 
Um, in the CNN inference paper, we used additively homomorphic encryption plus uh, permutations, and we had to use permutations there to implement linear layers. You needed matrix vector multiplication there. And you know, this the first part of this talk will go along much, very much along these lines, and I'll show you how to use sort of additively homomorphic encryption without the permutations uh, to construct a new batch OLE scheme. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk. Um, actually, let me. Uh, there are uh, questions, some for me. Uh, okay, so I'm going to actually take these questions in a, in about 10 minutes when I finish describing the protocol. Okay, so that's okay. All right, so so let's sort of get into the protocol. So here's how you here's what batch only is to begin with, right? So you have two parties. One of the parties, Alice, has two vectors, A and B. So length n vectors from Zp, just like I described before. Um, Bob has a vector x, and Bob, after this interaction, wants to get a times x plus b, where the multiplication is again coordinate wise. Okay, good. So how do you do this? Okay, so before doing that, this is a fundamental building block of arithmetic multiparty computation. Um, you know, there are other things that you heard about or will hear about, but these are sort of special cases, like vectorally is the setting where x is actually a scalar and a and b are vectors. OLE is when you know all of these things are actually scalars, and oblivious transfer is OLE where P is actually two. Right? So, so a lot of sort of special cases, the OLE kind of batch OLE sort of generalizes all these settings. Okay, so how do you do batch OLE? And you have additive homomorphic encryption at, at hand uh, with the instruction set that I described before. So how do you do it? Here is a naive protocol. I'll ask Bob to encrypt his um, vector x using an additively homomorphic encryption, send it over to Alice. And Alice is going to compute a times x plus b homomorphically. And this uses one scalar multiplication and one homomorphic addition. That's it, end of story, right? So this is more or less it, except not quite. So this naive protocol has uh, the following problem, which is, you know, which is something that you can see, to, to, to see this problem, you need to actually look into the guts of the beast. You need to look into the belly of homomorphic encryption and here's what it is, okay? So if you look at a ciphertext in an additively homomorphic encryption scheme, it looks like many numbers. How many n, which is, a, which is the number of slots. And each ciphertext looks like, well, the message that you encrypt in the most significant bit. So that's the, the top, the blue color. And then a bunch of noise uh, lives in the least significant bits of this uh, this number, right? So that's how that's how a ciphertext looks like. N slots, each slot is a single number. The MSB contains the message. The LSB contains junk noise, which will eventually be removed as part of the decryption process. Okay, noise is necessary for security, but it'll eventually, once you have the secret key, Bob can actually take this off and get the most significant bits, which is a message. Okay, so this is how it looks like. And the key difficulty here is that when you manipulate, when you take an encryption of X and you compute a function homomorphically, the noise in the resulting ciphertext, the homomorphically evaluated ciphertext, depends on the function that you computed. So the function that Alice here computed depends on A and B, and therefore the noise in the least significant bits actually depends on, on A and B, uh, both A and B. Now, the problem is that when Bob sees the ciphertext and he actually decrypts it, he sees the noise. He can actually recover the noise perfectly. That will tell him what A and B. In fact, this is not a theoretical attack. You can actually recover A and B if you construct the ciphertext of X carefully. Okay, so this is a real attack. We need to protect against it. And the and people have done that. And we know how to protect against this kind of attack. And the way people do it is to say, well, look, Alice computes homomorphically an encryption of AX plus B, and she doesn't just kind of sit there, she, she dunks the whole ciphertext in noise. Okay? So she adds to every slot of the ciphertext a large amount of noise. And how large is large? That is sort of uh, guided by this noise flooding lemma. It's a super simple sort of statement. And that says that uh, if you take two distributions here, Gaussian, but you could actually generalize it for so the square distrib uniform distribution or whatever you really want. So what it says is that uh, if you take two Gaussians that are separated by X, whose means are separated by X and standard deviation is sigma, their statistical distance is basically the gap divided by the standard deviation. 
makes intuitive sense, right? So two Gaussians which are very close to each other in means, um, what does it mean very close? It's close compared to the standard, distance, standard deviation of the Gaussians, they are actually statistically uh, close, okay? So, so what does this tell us? It tells us how much noise you need to add to the ciphertext to actually get privacy against uh, a semi-honest um, uh, Bob. And it tells you that you need to add lambda additional bits. Okay, so if the noise in the homomorphically evaluated ciphertext was 50 bits, then you need to add 90 bits, an additional 40 bits, where 40 is my statistical security problem. You need to add 90 bits to get two to the minus 40 statistical uh, security. So that's what the noise splitting lemma tells me. Okay. So that's what that's what it is. And that's how you know all the OLE protocols in the literature uh, went. Um, and really the key point here is that the cost that this adds in terms of the communication already is multiplicative. Right? Because in each slot you're adding, regardless of how small the plaintext are, you're going to have to add lambda bits of error, and that costs in total lambda n um, bits for the communication, this is regardless of how small the plaintext space is. Okay. So, so here is how the picture of naive batch only looks like. You know, the first message is actually going to be very large. Well, you know lambda n bits in total, as opposed to essentially n or n log n bits uh, that you would expect without um, this noise planning. Good, okay. So Karsten, thank you for, <laughs> for answering uh, the questions. Um, good, okay, so so fine. So what, what can you do that is better than this? Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's the question we ask. To do that, um, well, so, so, so we come up with this sort of, uh, the key idea in this work is, is do noise flooding, but do gentle noise flooding, okay? So, so we call this noise drizzling in the paper. So don't go all out, but just be careful, be judicious and sparing in how you use homomorphic encryption. okay? So to illustrate that, let's uh, actually uh, play a little game, okay? So we have a number M, this is the thing that I'm trying to flood. And, uh, and let's say for a moment, the number is uh, sort of between zero and uh, 10 any number between zero and 10. The noise that I'm going to add, the gentle noise that I'm going to add is a random number between zero and 20. Okay, so that's like one bit more than the, the, the message space, right? So I'm going to look at the noisy number, which is M plus eta. And, uh, and really the question I wanna ask is, can you guess M or how well can you guess M? Can you so really hide all information about M? That's the question I'm gonna ask. Um, so let's uh, let's do it. Okay. So let's say for a moment that uh, when I added up the message and the error and the noise, I got a zero. Okay. Can you guess what the message was to begin with? Anyone? Any volunteers? Uh, yeah. So I know that the message is within the range zero to 10, okay, inclusive. I know that the noise is a random number between zero and 10. Somehow, when I took the message and added the error, I got a zero. No modular arithmetic here, okay? Just sort of, I don't know, like first grade arithmetic, okay? You add over the integers. What could the message have been? Zero is the only possibility, okay? The only way you could have gotten to zero by adding a number in this range and that range is when both of them were zero, okay? So that's, it's, it's a perfect break of privacy, right? What if on the other hand, the noisy number was 10? Okay, could you say anything about the, the message M here? Okay, that requires a little bit more thought. Um, but if you think about it, I'd see 10. For every possible value of M in the range zero to 10, there is a unique eta that would have given me this T, right? So if M was zero, then the noise was 10. If M was 10, the noise was zero. So there's a unique such value. So that leads us to our gentle noise flooding lemma, which says that if T falls in the range, the noisy number falls in the range 10 comma 20, 
then M is perfectly hidden. Okay, so that's the lemma. More precisely, for any alpha and beta in the range uh, zero to 10, these now these sort of the probability that m is alpha given a t which given the t falls in the range 10 20 is the same as the probability that m is so you get semantic security condition on the fact that uh, t falls in this range okay yeah so far so good all right so so what so what do you do i don't want to encrypt one number remember we encrypted numbers in many slots so i have many numbers i have many noises one to each slot and i've given many noisy numbers and, uh, and the question is, can you guess these MIs? Um, the gentle noise plotting lemma tells you that, you know, in this setting where you have the ranges that I spoke about, uh, where the noise is one bit more than the uh, message space, you know that at least half the MIs are perfectly hidden, right? Because the probability that the MI falls into the, the noisy uh, uh, MI, which is TI, falls into this range 10 comma 20 is uh, at least a half. The worst case is when the message was zero, right? And you added a random number from zero to 20, the probability that it falls in 10, 20 is a half. Okay, so at least half the messages are perfectly hidden. But that's not what you want in crypto, right? You want semantic security. You want, you know, all the MIs to be hidden, right? Why is that? Because if an MI is not hidden, that's actually going to reveal information about the AI and BI. So if you pop back the stack and see where we are coming from to, uh, to this point, right? So you really want to hide all of A and B, and that involves hiding all of MI. So how do you do it? So this is where the second idea sort of comes in. And, uh, you know, can any, does anyone want to take a shot at it? I think at this point, people can simulate my, uh, you know, our paper. Um, anyone want to take a shot at it? You can't hide everything, that's what I'm saying, but you can hide half of the numbers. But from there, I want to go to a setting where I can hide all the numbers. You do secret sharing, okay? So instead of encrypting numbers like X by itself, you take a number and you secret share it. You use packed Shamir secret sharing to, to sort of, you know, blow it up a little bit, right? How much do you need to blow up? We'll get to that in a second, but not much in constant factor, really. Uh, and what you do is you secret share the actual message into a longer M prime and you gently plot M prime. What that tells you is half of the message in, with high probability on at most half of the M prime leaks and that hides M, M, M perfectly well. Okay, so that's it. That's, that's, that's that. Now we want to put it together into a protocol. So I'm going to ask Bob not to encrypt his X, but secret share. Uh, using a packed, using Franklin Jung, I suppose, a packed Shamir secret sharing scheme into an X prime. And um, Alice would do the same thing with A and B to A prime and a B prime, and she'll compute this homomorphically. And, uh, and at the end, uh, Bob will decrypt this uh, ciphertext and decode the secret sharing uh, to get AX plus B. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's how it goes. What is the overhead? The overhead is um, uh, you need to expand from X to X prime. And, uh, and turns out that you can pack essentially N over two minus lambda inputs into N shares, and that will give you two to the minus lambda statistical security for Alice against a malicious, against a semi-honest ball. Okay. And the key thing to note here is that the overhead is additive, because in each slot, I added one bit of noise in addition, as opposed to lambda bits. So one bit times n, uh, and, and uh, I did, did this for sort of n slots, so that's n bits. But then I had to expand, I pay the price in kind of having to expand a smaller message into a larger message, and that's the plus lambda. Okay, so this is what, uh, this, is what uh, this is what I get. So you get additive overhead as opposed to the naive multiplicative overhead. Concretely, uh, we, uh, we implemented this and sort of tested it against sort of the state-of-the-art uh, early protocols, um, uh, which is uh, an older work with uh, Leo and uh, Chirag, and also a very nice work of uh, Karsten and, uh, and friends. I don't remember the full list of authors. Um, and they actually construct an OLE protocol, which is sort of one round. So these are two round protocols, right? I send you, you send me. They construct a one round protocol for random OLE. Um, and that's what we compare against. And it turns out that, you know, not surprisingly, uh, uh, in a setting where you have small-ish plaintext spaces, and you have uh, smallish batch sizes or medium length batch sizes, we get better communication compared to these early schemes. 
And uh, compared to pa Payet, you get far better computational cost. Okay, so Payet needs to manipulate 1496 bits and it needs to do exponentiation. There is no exponentiation here. All you need to do is sort of, you know, parallel multiplication of numbers and parallel addition of numbers. Okay, so this brings me to a sort of a bigger point, which is that, you know, there are really many different kinds of homomorphic and additive homomorphic interruption schemes out there. There's Payer, and then there is ring de Bui based additive homomorphic interruption. And they, are, they do very, very different things. So if you are faced with a setting where you want to manipulate a lot of small numbers, you want to do additions and scalar multiplications on them, ring de Bui is your friend. You should probably be looking at sort of the protocols and implementations based on these things. Right. So that's the message. We also sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, look at applications, uh, for example, setting up sort of the seeds of the uh, 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 pseudo random correlation generator, which you heard about in your wild talk, is an example where, you know, this would, this would come in handy. Um, and, and sort of taking a step back, we introduce a new notion uh, called asymptotic quasi optimality uh, in this work. Um, so what is asymptotic efficiency? Asymptotic efficiency in cryptography means that you want to solve n instances of a problem, like n y batch only. And you know, asymptotic efficiency says that your efficiency should be essentially order of n or tilde of n plus poly lambda. Right? The, the message being that as n goes to infinity, the poly lambda kind of is amortized away and you get essentially you know, constant or, or logarithmic overhead. Right? What we propose here is to look at a a, a more stringent notion of efficiency, which is to solve n instances of a problem with efficiency n plus lambda, okay, no poly, n plus lambda. And the consequence of that is that, you know, while you may take a long time to get to the asymptotic regime to hit the poly lambda in the previous, in the case of asymptotic efficiency, you get to the asymptotic regime faster. Okay. So that's a high level message. Of course, it depends on a lot of sort of hidden things here. It depends on the constant in the O notation. It depends on the logarithmic factors and so forth. But high level, this is what we want to achieve. And this is what our OLE protocol actually demonstrates in concrete terms. Okay, we show other results. We use this to build a half malicious uh, you know, batch OLE, uh, sort of like Naur Pincus. Um, we use it to build zero knowledge protocols and MPC protocols and so forth. All these things are sort of theoretical. Uh, the one thing that we concretely evaluated was the OLE protocol, uh, just to show that this sort of new notion, if used carefully and judiciously, can actually give you, can actually result in new ideas, like our gentle noise flooding idea, and better protocols in some cases. So that's the message of the paper. So you, you should really think about it as so like we are going into, we, I'm, we're not building a secure computation protocol. That's not the point of this talk. We're going into the guts of secure computation. We're saying, well, what is the fundamental building block of secure computation and can we make it better? And that's what we do. Okay, good. So that's the first part of the talk. How much time do I have? Uh, okay, uh, 10 minutes, something like that. All right, good. So, um, uh, I'm assuming that Karsten is going to answer all the uh, all the questions I have. Uh, you know, so I'm going to not look at the questions until the end. Good. So I want to move on to the second part where I'll completely switch gears and I want to talk about, you know, um, the ideal world is where there is this massive bridge between secure computation and privacy-preserving machine learning, and you go back and forth and you're very happy. Okay? But that's not really the case, and I want to sort of highlight one problem that's at the interface between the two fields. Um, and again, like I said, you know, I have only open problems to offer here and I hope people will, so this is a call to action. You know, we in the crypto community should think about the end to end sort of setting of privacy preserving machine learning, which involves lots more problems than secure computation. Good, okay, so let's get into it. Okay, so the, the fundamental sort of observation here is that secure computation protocols you know, ideal real secure computation protocols are only as good as the ideal model. Their security is only as good as the ideal model. Yes, so this is a tautology, like everybody knows this, but, but that's what it is. What that says is that there are two, at least two things that an adversary can do in the ideal model, and that, the, the you know, the adversary can do in the real, real world as well. There's nothing preventing it. And one is that the adversary gets to pick the input. Two is the adversary gets to see the output. Anybody can do it in the in the Oracle model, so therefore, you know, it's fair game in the in the real world as well. Okay, so you might ask me, like, but 
what the hell? You know, like, what are you going to do about it? Okay, what are you going to do about it? I'll focus on the output, seeing the output uh, part in this talk. And the question, you know, here is what do the outputs of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a sort of secure protocol or what are the outputs of a computation in general reveal? Uh, and I'm going to zoom in even further and look at repeated executions of a protocol uh, where one of the inputs remains fixed. And this is really the setting of secure inference uh, where one party sort of, you know, chooses a model. And um, by definition, this is only useful when this model is used many, many times to do inference. Right. So the, the other party picks many sort of inputs and gets the model, gets the prediction or classification or whatever um, uh, using this model. Right. So that's the setting. And this sort of leads us to the to the to the model stealing or model stealing attack setting, uh, where the ideal adversary has query access to the model and it, it could potentially make a few queries to this model and reconstruct another model M prime. Uh, that is essentially as good. Okay. So this is an attack that has nothing to do with the secure computation protocol. It has to do with the ideal, so-called ideal model, right? Yeah. So again, you could ask, you know, what uh, what do I do about it, Vinod? You know, like this is this is you know an ideal world permits this attack. So what are you going to do about it? In other words, this attack seems unpreventable. Right? especially in the setting because the model is learnable. Like somebody actually took a trove of data, you know, ran some funny machine learning algorithm on it and learned the model, okay? So an adversary could make as many queries, right, potentially, and actually learn, replicate this learning process. So, so in some sense, it, this is actually an unpreventable attack, okay? But that's a silly answer, of course, because what you want to do is you want to draw your goalposts better. Uh, what you want to do is to get best possible security, which is to say that any adversary that um, you know queries this model and um, reconstructs uh, an essentially as good model M prime has to make as many, nearly as many queries as the learner himself who got just a collection of data, you know, points drawn IID from a distribution, let's say, uh, and actually ran a machine learning algorithm. And in other words, the sample complexity of an adversary in this ideal world should be nearly as much as the sample complexity of a completely non-adaptive, you know, machine learning algorithm. Okay, that's the best possible you could hope, but that's a very challenging goal. It's a very challenging goal because a model stealing adversary has far more power. It can make its queries adaptively, right? You know, I can sort of make a query, learn the answer, and depending on it, make another query. And even if you cannot make the queries adaptively, the adversary can choose potentially correlated queries. And even if you cannot choose these queries, uh, you know, to, to be correlated, it can choose the queries from out of distribution. It can choose some other distribution of sort of inputs and try to um, um, sort of use that uh, to learn. And so this is a very, very, very challenging setting. Um, but regardless, my point is that for the area of secure inference to make end-to-end -end sense, we have to think about uh, this attack and we have to do something about it, okay? Yes, that's, that's my high level. So, um, um, so, uh, so let me sort of, you know, I have to show something technical here, right? I can't just sort of, you know, preach and go away. Uh, so let me show you this sort of simple observation, which is a, a negative result with uh, Akshay, Itai, and uh, Shafi. Uh, and what we say is that even if an adversary does not have all these powers, cannot choose things adaptively, it has to be non-adaptive, cannot choose sort of out of distribution queries. In fact, very benign looking adversaries, even those adversaries can be lethal, can actually do model stealing, um, you know, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's our result. So more uh, concretely, uh, what we say is that there's a class of models which are stealable, even by a non-adaptive adversaries whose queries are jointly statistically close to the data distribution. So in other words, you know, if I'm sitting on the other end, trying to detect some anomaly in the list of queries, I won't be able to, because the queries look jointly close 
to the prescribed distribution, which in this case will be the uniform distribution. And yet the guy will actually manage to completely reconstruct the model. Okay, so that's terrifying. Okay, so it says, you know, it's, it's unpreventable. You know, this really is an unpreventable attack. So here's my model. This is going to come from the cryptographic world, probably nothing like what you see in the real world, but you know, that's, that's where I live. Okay, so, so that's what you get. Uh, here's the model. The model has a vector S in its head. Okay, so this is a vector is from a finite field. Um, the queries are vectors themselves, and the answer is in a product between the two vectors, the query vector and the model vector. Okay. So it's a first take. So this is actually easy to steal even with random queries. Even if you don't do anything, even if you just keep getting sort of random sort of uh, A in a product S is for random A's, you can steal it. Okay, so that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm going to modify this a little bit. I'm going to have the model actually return a noisy answer to the inner product question. Okay. Now this has two effects. One, um, first of all, this is easy to steal with correlated queries. Okay, so if you can make sort of queries individually that look like uniform, but they're correlated across the queries, then you can actually steal it. Uh, and the answer to cryptographers should be obvious, should be immediate, and that uses Goldrick Lab. Okay. So people have written papers about this, uh, you know, actually doing this in practice. Uh, and guess what? They use uh, sort of differential cryptanalysis, but differential cryptanalysis is like, guess what? It's Goldrick Lab. Okay, so at the end of the day, Goldrick Levin or differential cryptanalysis, which came a few years later in the open literature, uh, you know, tell you how to, how to, how to actually do this okay. with correlated queries. And correlated queries are super important for Goldrick Levin. On the other hand, if I'm just given many samples A and A in a product S plus E, noisy A in a product S, then Regev's learning, this is Regev's learning with errors problem. You cannot do anything about it. In fact, these, you cannot reconstruct this. And in fact, these things look totally random to you. Okay, so that's fact two. So now you look at my theorem and say, how can you possibly prove this theorem, right? The queries of the non-adaptive adversary, they look jointly close to just getting many A's, right? Together with A in a product S plus independent noise. Isn't that just the Regev learning with errors problem? How is this adversary going to work? So here's the key. The key idea is to use lattice trapdoors. And here's a one slide sort of summary of what lattice trapdoors are. It gives you a way to pick a matrix. Each of the columns of this matrix, you should think about it as a query in our setting. You can pick this matrix so that this matrix is statistically close to uniform. So these queries jointly are statistically close to IID random, right? But you can pick it together with a trapdoor, which is itself a matrix, such that the product of the two matrices is zero mod Q. So this trapdoor is low norm, each entry is very small, it has full Z rank, but the product is actually zero mod Q. Okay, this is the magic of lattice trapdoors came from Itai's work in the 90s. So how are you going to use, how is this adversary going to use the lattice trappers? Its queries are going to be the columns of this matrix. It's going to pick this matrix like so, right? It's going to make queries which are columns of this matrix. Uh, and it's going to get the answer, which is S times A plus E, which is a vector, the vector of all answers, multiplied by T, right? So you get A times T is zero, so you get E times T mod Q. E times T is small, so the mod Q doesn't make a difference. This is a standard in lattice-based cryptography. It's lattice crypto 101, right? And you get E times T and T is full rank over the integers. So you can recover E and therefore S. Done. Okay. So here's an attack that a defender looks at it and says, it looks exactly statistically close to what I expect in a, in a, in a, in a benign setting. And yet it's going to kill me. Okay. So what that says is that, uh, I'm not going to talk about this. So what that says is that it's, you know, defending against model stealing sounds incredibly difficult, okay? Lots of attacks against particular models. And some of these attacks, papers actually come up with defenses, but defenses without proofs, right? So, so I'm not sure what that actually means. So I would, I would say these are attacks, okay, end of story. And what we saw is a negative result, which is an undefendable attack. So, I'm so these attacks may be defendable, maybe not, who, who knows? But here's an undefendable attack. Okay, so I don't see how to, seems like an undefendable, I don't see how to defend against the attack that I just talked about at all. Okay, so the open question is, think about it, okay? 
come up with more attacks, come up with negative results that not only tells you that this neural net or that neural net can be attacked, or this class of neural net or that class of neural net can be attacked, even that is actually an improvement, but really say what can and cannot be done fundamentally in this area. Okay, I didn't talk about uh, if you have a toy positive result and, uh, and you know, um, uh, I didn't talk about it because it's toy, it's weak. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and then we come up with this strategy called measure and terminate. Uh, so what that says is, you know, I'm going to look at the queries, I'm going to measure the information content that that reveals, how much information about that, about the model does it reveal? And if it becomes too much, then I say, I'm done, okay? So you can actually use that strategy to protect against very, very, very simple models. So maybe I'll show you the picture here. This is a model. Uh, oi, oi, oi. Okay, here's a model, okay? So the model is, uh, you know, points on a unit uh, circle. Some points are positive and some points are negative and a hyperplane separates between them. And here you can actually measure eff efficiently how much information did you reveal about the model? And even that is very, a very questionable sort of positive result because you know, these queries may not all come from the same person. There could be collusions of people. Each one looks truly random, but together they can actually sort of, uh, you know, they can actually do funny things. Uh, and in slight, even slightly more general sort of models, measuring this information is an intractable problem. It's just computationally seems very complex. So what do I do? I don't know. Right? That's why it's an unpublished result uh, at this point. So we, uh, we were thinking of sending it to CFIL and we, we might actually at some point, but you know, it, seems, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems very open. But I, I think for the field of secure inference to make sense, we must think about this, this question. Okay. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. I really didn't get to talk about so many other problems that, uh, that, that come up in the gap between secure computation and privacy preserving machine learning. First of all, the adversary gets to pick the input, okay? So what do we do uh, in secure computation? We say, ah, eh, what are you gonna do about it? Okay, so you can pick the input, you can pick the input. Now, you know, if um, the function to be computed is fixed, then we may not be able to do anything, but what differential privacy taught us is that the function that we want to compute on data may not sort of come right from God, we may be able to design it uh, to be better. Okay. So you may be able to design functions that compute the same, so achieve the same end goal, which may be robust. You should look at, you should look at the field of robust statistics, so the, so the hot field of robust statistics for clues on what to do here. Um, the other question that comes up is strategic input. So, so again, you know, let's say I want to train a machine learning model. You know, I have a million data points and, uh, well, let's flip the role. Okay. So this is more accurate. Antigone has a million data points and I have a hundred data points. Okay. That's not inaccurate from where I stand and where she stands. And we want to do secure, and I go to Antigone and say, look, let's do secure computation and let's train a model on our collective data. Okay. And she should come back to me and say, why should I do it? You know, so she is contributing so much more data into the process. At the end of the secure computation, we're both going to get the same model. Why should she do it? So this is a question of strategic inputs and the value of data. And this has been sort of, uh, you know, addressed or rather sort of, uh, people have started looking at it. There's a work of uh, Christos Papadimitriou and Kostas Daskalakis that address this question. There's a work of Shafi Golbasar and Sunu Park and Pablo Azar that also look at this question. But really, these are sort of like, you know, blind people looking at the elephant. I don't think we really have a, I don't want to call these blind people. I mean, they're, they're amazing people, but we haven't started to scratch the surface of this area. Again, you know, the problem that Astri gets to see the output, even without the repeated executions, is question of how much information about the input do I, does this process reveal, this differential privacy, which addresses a part of this question, but not everything, right? So the differential privacy framework says, I'm going to hide, I'm going to let individuals hide in the data. But it could be that in the process of computing a differentially private estimate of the height of a population, I also reveal a differentially private estimate of the weight of the population, and that won't be good. Right? So there's a no, new set of works on attribute privacy that address these questions, or functional privacy or attribute privacy that address this question. And again, lots more people from our community need to be aware of these works, need to think about them, and need to make progress on them. With that, uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Vinod. Uh, any questions? We had many questions over the chat. So maybe it's good also to... Uh... Uh, so maybe I can go from the bottom up. Uh, Amit <laughs> uh, asks the negative results just for the class of models. Can you comment more on how broad and narrow is this class? class? This class is very narrow, right? It's linear functions over a finite field, which never comes up in practice as far as I, my machine learning friends tell me. Um, you know, it's just a template, right? It's a template on what could possibly go wrong. And um, I'll post it to you as an open problem to come up with more wide ranging negative results or come up with positive results, okay? Uh, Karsten asks, when will the paper be available? Soon coming to an ePrint next year. <laughs> Um, Amit says, does the extension to any arbitrary data distribution work by just picking weighted uniform lattice travelers? So that's a very good question. We haven't thought about that. Um, very good question. Let me just kind of leave it at that. Okay. I don't know the answer. Potentially possible, but I don't know the answer. And the other questions, thank you very much. Karsten answered the other questions. Um, and Karsten says secret sharing. Thank you. He could have written the paper, half the paper at least. Okay, so I uh, yeah I'll, I'll welcome any more questions. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, all set. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Great. Bye. Uh, we'll take.